It's because of climate change that we find ourselves, we, even without climate change, we probably should have found ourselves on this path of renewable energy and trying to make sure that we were providing resources to people that was clean and was good for the environment and reducing carbon emissions. But because of climate change and because of the fact that we see that we're in the sustained drought conditions and wildfires are not just the wildfires of old, these are yeah. catastrophic wildfires that are devastating communities and burning up the state, that we have to do something that is really bold and aggressive. Hello and welcome to another episode of Sacktown Talks. Today we're glad to be joined by Assemblyman Chris Holden, just finishing up his 10th year and going on to an election here for his 11th. Chris, how's it going? Thanks for joining us. It's my pleasure. It's uh, great to be here. Certainly, uh, I've had a little bit of a break from Sacramento. I've been in my district for the last month or so and, uh, you know, it's that campaign season. Right, right. No, it's definitely a, a good time to be down, down in the district. It's beautiful down there. Just yeah. down there the other day. Uh, every day is pretty perfect. So <laughs> I like to think I have the best district in the state. Yeah, definitely one of the best. One yeah. of the best, definitely with the uh, UCLA and the Rose Bowl uh, doing a little better this year. So That's right. it's always good news for uh, people in Pasadena. So uh, definitely. Uh, Chris, for, for kind of our listeners who don't know your background, can you kind of tell us kind of, you know, how you started in politics? And I, I know you started at the city council level, but kind of what did you do before you got into kind of politics and, and the assembly? Uh, before I got into politics, I was a basketball player. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I uh, had a great career in high school. Uh -huh. uh, we were state champs for two years in a row. Uh, we beat the number one team in the country to, to win that, uh, that second title. Uh, we represented the United States in the World High School Games in 77. Uh, and that was in Barcelona, Spain. Wow. In the finals against Spain. Uh, and we, had it not been for the fact that their so-called high school uh, athletes mm -hmm. were bald and had beards, so I think we would have won that one. <laughs> uh, so it was, they had a few ringers yeah. in there. Yeah, it was, uh, it was just that time where the United States didn't lose international competition right. in basketball. So even at our level, the, the stakes were high. And, and so this was an opportunity to say, hey, look, we're going to beat a, a U.S. team. And, and I guess after that, the experience really taught us a lot in terms of worldview about um, different cultures and societies. Right. Being in Spain at that age, it was really an eye opener. Um, I was recruited by a number of universities. Mm -hmm. I ended up at San Diego State. Uh, they had a tremendous up uh, cycle within their basketball program. I saw that as being great because they were moving into a, the Western Athletic Conference, which had universities like Brigham Young University, BYU, Utah, Wyoming, right. the University of Hawaii. And uh, and then of course, San Diego State had one of the best undergraduate business schools in the country. So it was those combination of right. reasons. And San Diego is a pretty great place to, to live too. Yeah, right? not to mention that it averages what, 74, 76 right. degrees yeah. uh, year round. But uh, that, was, that, was a, that was a wonderful experience. Uh, Dr. Weber was down there at the time. Really? She was doing her She's a professor. I didn't take her courses, unlike uh, my colleague, Steve Bradford, who uh, says that that was one of the toughest courses he's ever right. had. So, um, but, but I kind of wish I had, because she certainly, as I've gotten to know her in my adult life and here in the legislature, just an amazing person with such a, an incredible understanding of different levels of life and being able to relate at so many different right. levels and so smart and, and so I've enjoyed her presence, but San Diego State was a great opportunity. I came back, I took a job working for um, the probation department, Juvenile Hall. Mm -hmm. It was a night shift. I worked from 10 to 6 in the morning. Uh, and one of the things that I recognized at that time was that, you know, you have all of these young people who are finding their way into a prison system. What can I do? What, what is it that's causing them to find this path uh, that they find themselves on? And is there any role that I could play uh, to make a difference? And it was right. at that time, as a 23-year-old, that I decided that I would run for the city council. Wow, so you got right into politics right away. Was the, was the NBA ever a possibility? You know, it was, um, in my mind it was. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the scouts, uh, not quite as yeah. much. Um, but I did have an opportunity to play um, in a uh, in the Summer Pro League. Mm -hmm. And the Summer Pro League was designed to allow for those uh, athletes who weren't 
uh, drafted to have a chance to still right. be a free agent. Um, and I was I didn't make that cut, but I did have offers to go to Europe and play. Uh, one was um, in Manchester, England, and the other was in Ireland. And I decided that it seemed to be a cut a little bit below maybe Italy and the Italian leagues and right. some of the other high profile. Uh, so I went back, finished my degree, and uh, when I finished up with that, it was sort of uh, out of the cycle of uh, the scouting process. So that's when I found myself on the path uh, to politics. Although I will say that I had in the middle of my campaigning as a 23 year old, I had a good friend of mine who was um, in New Zealand and he said, he called to say, look, we have an opening on the team. You know, there's two Americans on right. most of these international teams. So there's a spot. We need a big guy. Come on over. We'll have a blast. It'll be a great chance to, to play. And I said, you know what? His name was Zach. Yeah. I said, Zach, look, I can't, uh, I'd love to, but I've made a commitment to run for office. And that was where I met my fork in the road. And when I made the decision to stay on the course I was on, then that uh, athletic door closed for good. Yeah. What, so what years were you, were you playing ball? Um, in college, I was playing uh, 70, uh, 78 uh, to 82. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and 83 was that extra year that I went uh, to finish up. Um, probably one notable that I always like to refer to as our point guard was Tony Gwynn. Right, Nobody yeah. really thinks of Tony uh, at that time as a, a basketball player. They only know him as a, as a baseball uh, phenom and, right. and obviously uh, San Diego Padre mm -hmm. uh, a favorite. But yeah, and Michael Cage uh, was also on that team. So we had some folks that made it to the NBA and, and, uh, and or professional basketball. And yeah, it was a great... Great chapter in my life. Did you guys ever make it to the NCAA tournament? And um, we made it to NIT. NIT. Okay. Yeah, we made it to NIT. We had um, we had a we had some good teams, but that was a tough league because yeah, you, like at that time you had like Magic. I guess we just like your freshman year that was like the Magic Bird year, right? Yep. yep. And then I, I guess you had Michael, Len Bias. You know, you ever play any of those guys? Um, uh, no, but I did. Uh, BYU had Danny Ainge. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Greg Kite, who played for Boston mm -hmm. as well. Um, but Danny is probably the one of the better players to ever come out of college right. basketball. Uh, we also had on our schedule Georgetown, so Patrick Ewing oh, was yeah. uh, was a force that I had an opportunity to. And you were the guy who had a guard of right? <laughs> <laughs> You know, is it, it, it really, yeah, right? You know, and and it really. And I guess for me, it became a realization that, you know, there are some guys on the planet that have been given God give, gifts of skill right. and size that just make them uh, very unique in their, in their ability to excel. He was one that you couldn't get over him, you couldn't get around yeah. him, at least I couldn't. And, and so I recognized that what my limitations represented in that regard. But it was also a time when the sport was changing. Magic Johnson was making it comfortable for big players to be out in the front facing mm -hmm. the basket with the ball in their hand. And and so for me, it was really sort of coming in. I always saw myself more as a Wes Unsell type of center forward. Yeah. Um, undersized, but strong. Uh, but at the same time... You, could you shoot? Um, well, my, again, I came along with, with big guys, right. you know, their back was to the basket. Right. You posted and then you had players cutting off of you. And if you saw the opportunity to get to the basket or you set a screen and then you right. roll that type of thing, that was the, but now, as you can see, you know, you can be a seven footer and take threes and, right. and, uh, and obviously they're excelling at making them. Yeah. So if, only games Sam, if only Sam Perkins played today. <laughs> I know, I know, yeah. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So then, you, you know, right. 23, you run, you run for uh, city council and, and basically you were just in the Pasadena city council, you know, just, just running through that. that line. Well, I did not win that first time. Oh, you didn't. Okay. No, I did not win. Um, I talked to the incumbent. Mm -hmm. She said that, I mean, these are jobs that were $50 a meeting. So right. it really wasn't, you know, you had to really be about the community and serving. And she said she wasn't going to run. And then of course, as a 23 year old, the gatekeepers of the community obviously wanted to have a more of a say in terms of who should be next. Right. Um, and I had just decided that I was going to run. My dad, who has been in politics for a long time, Nate Holden, served in the California State Senate from 74 to 78 and on the LA City Council for 16 years. So, wow. you know, um, so there was 
their expectation was that I was going to get into politics because of my dad, but mm. I got into politics because it was more of a public service and a pub, and, and being able to try to address the needs of people where I could. So when I ran, I just decided on my own. I told him that I was going to run after I decided, and he said, why would you do that? <laughs> so I guess he, he knew something more about right. what I was stepping into than I, I did. But I, I will say that once the incumbent decided not to run, I made the commitment, but then she was persuaded to get into the race. And so, um, but I did well. I think I had about 40% of the vote. Uh, and that just set me up well for the next time around. And I had decided I wanted, I didn't want to be that guy, that young guy who ran for office, didn't win and then disappeared. Right. So I stayed engaged, human relations commission, serving on the board of red cross, uh, chairing the redevelopment task force for the community that I was in. And then also sitting on the, uh, light rail alignment task force, which would back in 1985 laid out the foundations of how. Uh, rail would make its way, light rail would make its way into the San Gabriel Valley, mm -hmm. which we are now, I am able to still work on. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, the second time around, I ran, I won. I was about 27 at the time, mm -hmm. 27, 28. And uh, I was in that office, uh, served as mayor, uh, served as the, a member of the uh, the airport authority in Burbank uh, for 20 years. I was the president for eight of those 20. And during 9-11, I was the president. So we were very much under the gun. To, had some work to do. Yeah, Had some work to do. Yeah. Man, did, did they ever think about getting rid of the uh, outdoor exit at Burbank? Because that's the best part of Burbank is you can go out the back of the plane or the front of the plane. I hope it never changes. It's, it's a user friendly airport. Yeah. And then you walk right out, get your bag yep. and walk across the street and get in your car. Yeah. yeah so I'm going to credit that to you 100%. It's all about me. I just, yeah. If it wasn't for my Four the rental thinking. cars are close. You know, it's such a great airport. <laughs> no, it is a really, it's a great airport. And obviously one that has had to evolve and grow right. in a community that, like most, are concerned about having airport airplanes taking off at different times yeah. of the day and night. But uh, we've made our way through that. And I think they're looking at a new terminal uh, here in the foreseeable future. You know, all of us, you know, of course, see Pasadena once a year on TV. Rose Bowl Parade, and everyone sees the mayor of Pasadena on a float. How many times have you been on a Rose Bowl Parade float uh, featured on TV here? In your, Twice in your as years? a mayor and once as a, a former mayor. Um, I was on the Kiwanis float after serving on the city council. I think it was in the my first or second yeah. year here in Sacramento, and they invited me. But as mayor, it is special. You know, it is. Uh, and I had all my kids were young at mm -hmm. that time. I mean, really, you know, somewhere between four and seven. And so waking them up, having the police escort come to your house in the morning and uh, you get up and have everybody dressed because right. you're going to be on national worldwide television. It's it's a it's a big deal. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Um, you know, obviously, interesting things are going on around in L.A. Uh, city politics right now with kind of the scandal there at the city council and kind of with, you know, your experience and your dad's experience. Kind of what, what are your thoughts of what's going on there and kind of uh, how best to resolve those issues there? Well, I think that uh, the question to the answer to the question about how best to resolve is that the two remaining council members probably need will definitely need to resign mm -hmm. now. Um, whether they get there or not, uh, that's going to be obviously more of their choice. But there's going to be a lot of pressure, and there's going to be a lot of angst for the council to convene and do the work of the people of Los right. Angeles when that that element still exists. Um, you know, it's going to be rebuilding, and it's going to be it's going to require communities that have become allies uh, over the the decades. Uh, and I'm talking about back when civil rights was and civil rights laws were being uh, fought for, uh, and even beyond that, as we were all subjected to oppression and laws that were taking away rights and opportunities. And so, as communities that felt disenfranchised, we were always working together to sign or find a common path to make change. And so when you have the the kind of comments that make their way out from folks that you trust and believe yeah. in and work work with, um, it is a it is a shot in the in the gut. And it does take time to rebuild and re, re, rebuild from that. 
But I look at it from the standpoint, much like when you see what we've seen in recent times, when um, a law enforcement officer or two or three end up doing something that um, violates someone's civil rights or leads to harm, great harm mm-hmm. or death of that individual, uh, we can't blame all of the police officers, the good ones that have sworn to take an oath to protect and serve. And we, we know that this is a, these are folks who have sort of other things in their heart and mind, uh, but we don't hold uh, the rest uh, accountable for those missteps. And the same here. You know, yeah. we have some folks who let some things out that reflected what was in their heart, um, but we don't condemn the other folks that are of goodwill and good nature who want to see change happen and trusted them as well. And so it's going to take leadership. Mm-hmm. Uh, they have a mayoral race now that's going on. Um, I certainly have high uh, faith and confidence in Karen Bass because she's demonstrated bringing communities together over her career. And so you need someone like that who understands kind of the shoes that people have walked in who um, need their government to perform for them. Right. And so I'm very hopeful. Uh, we have to be hopeful because if we're not, the alternative is not is not a good outlook. Yeah, just like L.A. LA City, you know, just such a interesting background kind of uh, kind of with a lot of these issues, you know, dating back to, you know, Watts in 64, 90, you know, OJ, and, you know, we've had, you know, all this stuff recently with George Floyd and stuff like that. And you think yeah. we've, we've come so far, uh, you know, I, you were, you know, chair of the Black Caucus and do a lot of good work there. So I'm, what are some of the things you guys are, are working for? Because, you know, every every year you think you're, you know, you're doing better and that, you know, these issues are being, you know, finally uh, realized and solved. And then it's kind of reflected that maybe we're not, you know, as far as we think we are. So, you know, you know, yeah. what can we keep doing to make sure, uh, you know, we can make sh- this world a better place. Well, well, I, I think, well, first of all, I think that's, it's, it's important to note that it takes all of us really. It's a, it's a community, a larger community than just the electeds. It's the, the faith community. Um, it's for profit, nonprofit, it's black, it's Brown, it's white, it's Asian understanding that we all are different. We, but we're yet the same. And if we can kind of find that common way of continuing to work together. And I believe that's happened. I mean, I don't think that, I mean, I, I, again, I'm optimistic, but I also know that we've had some really important successes. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've had some important breakthroughs, uh, indications that there is a chance to see greater parity. Uh, but we also live in a world that is also made up of folks who feel like what you're trying to get is taken away from what they're trying to get or what they have. And so this you know, balancing of people's needs uh, I think is, is something very important. And the caucus has over 50 plus years uh, played an important role in terms of being the conscience of California politics for many yeah. years to be able to raise issues uh, that are important that actually not just benefit African-Americans but benefit all people. My dad, when he was in the legislature, uh, passed a bill that gave a women, women a right to get credit in their own name. Uh, before that, some male person in her life, a brother, a father, uh, uh, uncle yeah. would have to sign on the dotted line for them to get credit. And because of that bill and because of what happened in California as a result of it, it became sort of a forward moving ripple across the country. Mm-hmm. Um, the Fair Housing, the Rumford Fair Housing Act, uh, was a member of the Black Caucus, Byron Rumford, who moved forward legislation to look for equity and fairness in the housing yeah. arena. Um, move out forward to today, and we have a cr- social justice legislation that's looking at addressing the issues of reform and policing, uh, looking at reforms in education. Uh, Dr. Weber has, when she was a member of the legislature, her bill that was looking at studying reparations and what mm-hmm. that represents. Uh, I had a bill, Upward Mobility 1604, that also looked at giving opportunity for uh, people of color to be elevated and promoted within the ranks of the civil service system. Uh, but within that, we also had uh, a budget a request that was honored by the governor uh, that looked to uh, come up with a, a way of collecting data on sort of the background of African-Americans or or Africans or people of black descent 
much like Asian Americans, so that we can better cat- uh, distinguish um, where each person is actually coming from, mm-hmm. so that as the Reparations Commission moves forward and looks at remedies and solutions, they can have a better idea of how that should apply and who should benefit from it. So, you know, the journey and, and the struggle continues. Um, you know, I think equity in housing, uh, addressing the issue of homelessness, uh, creating jobs, education system, um, folks who are in business and who are minorities having an opportunity to get a fair share of state contracts and, yeah. and to be able to compete. I think that everyone wants just to have a, a level playing field and sometimes it doesn't feel like it's a loving level playing field. So as policymakers, it's our job to continue to shine the light on that. Yeah, no shortage of things to look at. I guess not Never, at all. No. Not at all. Um, you know, you know, this is election season. You know, you're you know reaching out to voters, kind of, kind of getting a lot of their thoughts and feedback. Kind of, what are what's front in mind of voters right now in your district? Well, I think you know the issue of um, homelessness. I think has mm-hmm. probably found its way to the very top of everyone's consciousness because. It's been there for a long time. It's been a priority. It's been an issue that needed to uh, have a very, that requires a complicated solution to. It's not an easy way to address it. I was engaged with uh, someone the other day and there was a conversation around an individual who was homeless who basically wanted to be. Mm -hmm. um, Had become comfortable living on the street. Did not want to be anywhere but on the street. Yeah. Uh, So there's that. But then there's also people who are being forced out of living situations because they've lost a job. The pandemic exacerbated that in many ways um, by putting a a pressure point on their ability to be able to stay in their housing. Um, And and so for people who are now seeing encampments uh, in communities that they never, suburban communities that they never thought that they would see, it's Mm -hmm. now even more in their of uh, uh, visual understanding. And so there's that recognition that yes, we need to do something and it's gonna require kind of a multifaceted strategy, you know, wraparound services, providing, recognizing that people find themselves homeless for various reasons. Some because as I say, yeah. because of the economics, others because they are dealing with mental illness and the system has not provided for them in the way that they need to. So they find themselves on the street. Families can't support the challenges that that represents. People who are formerly incarcerated who come out, who aren't prepared to meet a job market that find themselves between a rock and a hard place and are choosing maybe sometimes to go back uh, and, you know, engage in right. criminal activity again that find themselves back in the system. So it's a a lot of different elements, and I think the state has some ideas that are, are helpful, but we're looking to counties to also play a major role in helping to solve the problem. Yeah. Um, so we just kind of finished bill signing period, and you yep. had a bill signed by the governor, the Fast Recovery Act. Kind of what is that, and what are you expecting that to do kind of coming up here next year when it goes into effect? Well, I've, what we are hoping that that, what we know that that's going to do is create a council that allows for all the stakeholders uh, that are part of the fast food industry to be Mm -hmm. part of looking at what approaches can be taken to meet um, the needs of the fast food employee. Franchisors and franchisees are fairly well established in what their roles are, uh, but the employee is the third level of that uh, equation that brings value to the brand of Mm -hmm. a franchise. And in many instances, it's been seen and shown that there's been wage theft, that there's been individuals, especially during the pandemic, who were forced into working in situations where in environments that were not safe, they didn't have all the proper PPE equipment. Um, There are other that aren't necessarily getting the the minimum wage increases that they're uh, entitled to, uh, harassment in the workplace. So there are a variety of issues, and even though there may be agencies out there that are designed to address some of this, If the workers don't know that, if they're sort of kind of kept in a position where if they raise the question to someone that's going to put their job in jeopardy, uh, they're choosing to maybe not disclose or to engage. And so this council is designed to bring the workers, the franchisors, the franchisees, um, the director of industrial relations as the chair of this council Mm -hmm. uh, to evaluate all these different issues and make recommendations uh, for change. Now, the, the uh, legislature plays an important role because they have the opportunity to uh, weigh in if they so choose. 
Uh, they can change or they can write laws that can make a different, create a different outcome. So there is that control that's still, uh, still there. A lot of the elements that we believe that we heard uh, the opposition state around this, right. we made changes to address, um, but not apparently to their satisfaction. No, so, I remember the end of session, there was a lot of... Uh Angry fast food guys, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, and and the irony too is that even for the franchisees, they have their challenges with franchisors. Mm-hmm. I've had to write several bills to protect the franchisee. As right. a former franchisee myself, I understood some of the challenges that they were dealing with. So we're this bill is designed to help the franchise the the worker, mm-hmm. uh, but it also can be a benefit for the franchisee going forward as well. So that all kinds of issues within the workplace, since all of the stakeholders are engaged, gives us an opportunity to maybe have some further discussions on all, all folks that are tied into that environment to have their, their needs addressed equitably. No, no, it's, it's, it's great because, you know, as, as a former franchisee, you know, it's, they're squeezing the margins on, you know, everyone. So everyone. like, uh, you know, the real estate, the rent, the supplies, all that stuff. I've learned very much firsthand that uh, having one franchise is not enough. You need two or three or right. four to really then start to see the value, uh, or you're going to be really a slave to that business. And no, not, definitely not intended for that to be the outcome. No, and it's it kind of on that same same line is is something you're working on, and you know you touched upon earlier is is your kind of experience working in in kind of uh, juvenile institutions and things like that. And something kind of your focus on is solitary confinement yeah. and the Mandela Act. Can you kind of talk to us about kind of your thoughts and some of the things you're working on and kind of help that issue? Yeah. Um, well, we, you know, we were disappointed that the governor vetoed um, the bill. We think that there is a need to reform uh, the, how solitary confinement is utilized and the, the treatment of individuals who are in that, who are put, into solitary confinement. The bill was essentially just trying to codify what the world human rights um, environment and community believed through the Mandela rule with the United Nations stating how a person should be treated when in solitary confinement, how much time they should be allowed out of the prison or out of that environment Mm -hmm. so they can engage with other people. Um, We're not saying take it away completely other than for uh, pregnant women the individuals with mental or physical disabilities uh, and individuals who are, uh, you know, younger than uh, 25 Mm -hmm. are those older than 60. So those individuals would be excluded. Right. But everyone else would still recognize that if that's a tool that is needed by those who are in the correctional system, fine. But that you still have to give an individual an opportunity to have interaction, to get exercise, to also have uh, proper engagement. Uh, some of our witnesses were left in solitary confinement for up to 23 out of 24 hours a day. Uh, they were in there for maybe uh, months on end. And that is torture. Right. And that's why we were trying to mirror this bill to reflect the Mandela rules that the United Nations has used uh, to define how much time out of the cell, what kind of interaction should be given and how much over the course of a year an individual should be uh, held in that kind of a condition. And I think that the unfortunate part about it is that the uh, agency made some determinations that in order to implement the bill, it would cost billions of dollars. Which I was going to say, like, what? Well, so why wasn't this implemented? Like, what was the, the veto message? <laughs> the, the, the iron, the, what's ironic is that California, we, we really hold up the banner that we're uh, leading the charge and doing what's right, doing what's fair, doing mm-hmm. what's equitable, we would not have even been the first. So when you look at New Jersey, New York, right. um, and Colorado and other states that already have these changes in place, uh, all we needed to do, quite frankly, is say, what did you do uh, to make sure that it was uh, caught, it didn't break the back, of the financial back of the state in order to make the changes? Uh, if New York could do it, if New Jersey could do it, California could have done it. And I think that's where for many of us, um, we were disappointed with that outcome, but it's a righteous position to take. It's the right place for us to be. Uh, no one, and I'm not, this is not to say that, you know, you, you have some folks who have done some very bad things mm-hmm. that need to be in a correctional environment, uh, and maybe even some need to be segregated from, um, uh, 
other population groups within the, the prison system. But when you put them in an environment where and, and cut off their life support, I mean, we had one individual say that they have rather been beaten than to put in solitary confinement. That says something about how, what kind of mental anguish and, which, and torture is that, which right. will lead an individual to have suicidal thoughts. Um, we can't exist like that. We have to be better than that. And I think that the governor understands that. And I think he was um, uh, yielding to what his uh, you know, Department of Corrections was sort of laying out as a thought. But I'm hopeful that we can have another conversation around this next year and be more persuasive about how costs can be mitigated. Because again, if other states are doing it and it has not caused them to have financial um, meltdown, then I don't see why we could not do the same. And we do think, quite frankly, and there's been the, the, the advocates and sponsors of this bill yeah. have just been amazing uh, with their understanding and information and how they've even enlightened me to um, the ways that we can make this change happen and that how now is the time that it needs to happen. Yeah, no, no, definitely. Um, uh, kind of unimaginable, uh, especially from my background. I, you know, I, I used to uh, do some work in corrections and just kind of knowing, you know, uh, how those things go, like uh, that that would be uh, definitely difficult. Like a lot of those people are over 60 right yeah. right now. A lot of them, a lot of them are mentally ill. So, yep. um, yeah, it kind of exacerbates the problem. Yeah, I always say like you don't get into security housing for what you did outside of prison. You get into security housing for what you did inside of prison. Right, right. Isn't yeah. that something? Yeah. And then a lot of that, I remember going through some of these guys' files, and they would have um, very minimal crimes, right? Um, but they were mentally ill, or they, they, you know, didn't play well with others, and you know, right. kind of exasperated this, the the issues instead of of helping. So, yeah. um, you know, hopefully you can help and find a solution and uh, you know solve some of these issues. Well, I think we. I, you know, look, if we look at the glass as half full, we advance the bill to the governor's desk. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that at any point along the way, you know, it could have fallen um, off the, the table. Right. But um, it didn't. And so that's a victory in and of itself. That means the legislative body majority agreed that this was something we needed to do and we right. needed to do it now, notwithstanding what was being suggested as uh, somehow a uh, a budget breaker, right. but um, we're we're hopeful about the future and what yeah. it what it yields. You know, so so you've been around for for a decade now, um, and you've yeah. held you know different titles. You know, you were the the chair of utility and energy for a while. You obviously have a good grasp on uh, energy in California and things we need to do here to kind of become more green and and you know clean our air and keep going towards that. You know, lowering our carbon footprint. Kind of what what are some of the things that are, that are working right now, and kind of what more do we need to do? Because uh, there's kind of a sense out there that maybe we don't have enough energy or, you know, we need to start, you know, changing how we look at, at our grid and, and kind of yeah. developing towards the future. Well, it's because of climate change that we find ourselves, uh, we sh even without climate change, we probably should have found ourselves on this path of renewable energy and trying to make sure that we were providing uh, adequate resources to people that was clean and was good for the environment and reducing carbon emissions but because of climate change and because of the fact that we see that we're in the sustained drought conditions and wildfires are not just the wildfires of old, these are yeah. catastrophic wildfires that are devastating communities and, and burning up the state, uh, that we have to do something that is you know, really bold and aggressive and moving as quickly as we possibly can. You know, There was a report recently that talked about the fires of 2020 and how each one seemed to become the most right uh, the, you know, the biggest, the, one, the ever. B biggest yeah. one ever we were blowing records uh, off the charts left and right but as a result of that the carbon that's being emitted was wiping out all of our gains mm -hmm. and so it feels like you're you're on a treadmill right you're not you're working really hard but are we really moving and going anywhere right. um, and so to the extent that we can find ways of continuing to mitigate through uh, vegetation management, clearing out as best we can, uh, brush an area around uh, utility poles, utility industry, mm -hmm. I think has been very much focused on investing in that regard. But the bottom line is, is that, you know, lightning strikes, um, high wind events, uh, they, they will create havoc 
in, uh, given the fact that that's where we see the changes happening. So for utility industry, they obviously are paying more attention to being able to predict where high wind events would right. be going so that they can de-energize lines uh, at that particular time. So if they do happen to go down, they won't be live as they're hitting the, 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 the brush that's tinderbox uh, below. Um, but on the, on the larger front, uh, we continue to move towards 100% carbon free by 2045. Uh, but at the same time, because of the high heat events that we've had in recent years where it's not just impacting California, but the other 13 Western states where normally we would go to and say, hey, can we get some help oh, here? Right, right. You know, we can't because they're struggling to keep their lights on right. too. So when so many people, not just in any one sector of the state, but throughout the state are experiencing um, 110, 115. In Portland, Oregon, a, a year or so ago, it was 118. And then they had high heat last year. Wow. Then there's a, you know, catastrophic fire in uh, Oregon that threatens the transmission lines, which we are using to get power from, right. you know, uh, on hydropower. And so with all of that pressure, it puts on the grid because now air conditioning units are on not only d throughout the day, but into the evening mm -hmm. when the sun goes down. So you don't have the solar uh, power to, to rely upon storage isn't long duration like we need it to be. Um, and so we've got a lot of pressure points that then cause the grid to be up against uh, the potential of rolling blackouts, rolling brownouts. And then the only way that we seem to be averting these crisis moments is flex alerts. Well, that's not a long-term solution. Mm -hmm. So as the governor had brought forth a proposal of how we can maybe look to have at least greater access to um, to power uh, to meet the increased demand, uh, reactivating Diablo Canyon uh, nuclear power for some shorter period of time, which we were all able to negotiate as opposed to a longer period of time, mm -hmm. accelerate our renewable um, development so that we can see more wind, maybe offshore wind and others come online, uh, do more in terms of um, solar power and storage and how we can start integrating storage a little bit more efficiently based on technology and, and having longer uses of, of storage. Uh, those are the kinds of things that we have to keep focusing on. We have to keep accelerating on um, how we can then transition off of um, fuel generated cars to right. um, electric vehicles. Uh, that's a, that's going to be a challenge in and of itself. You know, there are habits that we all find ourselves uh, attached to uh, that as this industry evolves, which it is, and really good options are making their way to the marketplace for electric vehicles, having charging stations accessible so that it's easy for people to be able to utilize them. You don't want to be in environments where you have, well, where do I go to get charged right. charging? Um, so there's a whole, there's a lot going on. Um, the last thing I'll say on the, on the, on the point is that uh, as we look to next year, uh, I'm very hopeful. We, I had a, um, a resolution, uh, ACR 188, which was really giving some direction to the California Independent System Operator to bring together all of information that we need to know that would be helpful studies as well as decisions and what's already underway around looking at expanding the, the grid operation beyond California to providing that resource to the 14 other states in mm -hmm. the Western region so it would become a larger operation right. of uh, expanding the footprint of Cal ISO. And by doing that, uh, whether when we find ourselves at a place where we're cur curtailing uh, you know, solar power because we don't have a way to sort of hold on to it for, for longer use, then we can then export that power out to other states that could utilize it now uh, to meet market demand. The concept of regionalization has really been able to show us uh, that we can lower rates for ratepayers, be more efficient in how we utilize our, our resource power and be exporters when it makes the most sense and be importers to California when it makes the most mm -hmm. sense. And so I think that that has the value of other states now seeing 
that that works for them too because of the cost savings, right. which are in the billions of dollars for everyone who's participating, that can be a great incentive for California. That could be a very major value benefit for the ratepayers in California because every time they turn around, even with our renewable uh, goals and plans that we have underway, right. that's expensive. So this is the first approach that really looks at lowering costs, creating jobs for our electrical workers to continue to build uh, out charging stations, look at projects like offshore wind, so it will continue to mm. create jobs down in the salt and sea area, geothermal mining, uh, lithium mining, which is important for our battery long storage, uh, and then also the, the benefit of other states now having policies that mirror California, whereas maybe three or four or five years ago, they were more coal heavy, right. uh, fossil fuel heavy. Now they're starting to set policies that say, we want to hit 100% renewable by a certain date, similar to California. Why? Because it's it makes sense, but it also is more cost efficient for producing, mm -hmm. and it's also cost efficient for the end user and the, the customer. So it's a bigger strategy, right. uh, but I think it also benefits California in a major way. No, definitely. Uh, saving money is always good. It's always Bill good. Billions of dollars would be good. Um, I guess that's all I had to say yeah. really on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, you know, we always talk about like, you know, you got to lower your carbon footprint. We got to, we got to do less. And it seems like we're like always trying to get back to like these levels of, of yesteryear. Um, what are some of the things that we, you know, we we seem to like keep doing certain things, but are, is there still more that, you know, we're working on and, and some things that you're looking at right now? Well, I mean, I think it's also, it's, it's part of the equation is changing habits, um, doing things a little bit different. Right. Uh, you know, we obviously are stressed on the water side as well as what we're up against and we yeah. talked about on the power side, but certainly on the water side, you know, with the drought that seems to be, you know, ongoing, uh, you know, cities and, and water districts are putting penalties and tears in to say that you have to start being more conserving mm -hmm. of your water usage. And that becomes an individual or family just making a decision that I'm going to be part of the solution. Here's how I can do that changing out landscaping. There are rebates that allow for that to happen now so that you can take out the high water intense landscaping and go to more zero scape or less water demand. Um, shower times, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, when we had five kids in the house, that was a real challenge. <laughs> <laughs> and now that they've moved out, uh, it, not as much, but, um, but those are the types of things in terms of behavior, um, you know, we obviously are seeing pressure at the pump. Mm. We're investing in public transportation. In my community, we have a, a project, a 30-year project that's been in the making, and we're very close to completing it. We're looking for $748 million yeah. to be able to finish a gold line or rail project that takes, that makes its way from L.A. County into San Bernardino County, getting people out of their cars on public transportation, such as rail systems. Uh, reduces carbon emissions. It also reduces traffic on the highways, which is a big deal, especially in a district right. like mine, yeah. um, where I can be on the freeway just getting to the community of Claremont, which is maybe 20 plus miles away. And it can take sometimes on a Friday afternoon, you know, an hour plus right. to get there. So there are those type of things that we have to find our way to getting and with uh, getting to in terms of infrastructure improvements and the, the budget this year has money yeah. to do some of this. So That's we're funny. hopeful for that. Yeah, anytime you drive through LA, they, they want you to basically drive through your district around LA. <laughs> it's like and a it, tour. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's like, oh, I drive like an extra 50 miles, but it saves me five minutes. Okay. I, it's, it's, it's crazy. Yeah, it is. We're, we're at that, we're at a point in time in our history where we have to do some things a little bit different. And the unfortunate part is we become accustomed to doing it a certain way for so long mm -hmm. that changing behaviors, changing attitudes becomes a real challenge, but that's what we're going to have to do as we continue to evolve in technology, as we continue to adapt to some things that may not change, right? You know, the climate may get a little better here or there, but generally speaking, we may start seeing Wishful summers thinking, yeah. where we're going to get right. to 110 more times than not. Um, and so how do we, prepare ourselves to live in an environment that may be a little bit different than what we're used to uh, over the years. Yeah, it's crazy to think like 
you know, 10 years ago, people were like, oh, climate change, is it real? Like, oh, it's, you know, it gets colder and hotter all the time. And like the last, you know, five years has become really clear that like, yeah, it is real. And it's not just <laughs> us in California, you know, flooding in Tennessee, yeah. massive uh, hurricane events, not just what you would normally see, but seeing how devastating these um, natural disasters have been. As I've talked about the wildfires in California, but Colorado and Arizona right. and other states have seen them as well. Texas, not uh, earlier this year, they had a, a snow event right. that just shut down the grid. So being isolated is not a good thing. And yeah. I think we saw that as it affected that particular uh, state. So we're paying attention, not just here, but in Greece, wildfires over the years have been increasing in intensities. Mm -hmm. In Australia, uh, where they've had wildfires that have gone on for weeks, if not months at a time. So it, it, is, uh, it is real. Uh, sea level uh, levels are rising. Um, and, you know, coastal shores where people have lived in other parts of the world are now uh, being um, in, in encroached on by, by the water level taking over. And uh, so these are, they're there. Uh, I wish this was 20 years. We had, we could roll the clock right. back another 20 years and say, okay, that's what it's going to be. Yeah. Let's start doing some things a little smarter now. But yeah, definitely. Here we are. You know, so you had a, a unique opportunity here in, in your 10th year, you became the appropriations chair. Mm -hmm. Uh, how has that changed your life as a member of being appropriations chair, uh, versus a non appropriations chair? Um, I have more friends. Now. <laughs> <laughs> Are you better looking? Are you, uh, you know, <laughs> funnier? I, yeah. No, I, yeah, I guess. So. But but no, I I I um I've always tried to be a straight shooter mm -hmm. and fair. Um, I always tried to be uh, whatever role I I, I had, um, and in this role, I try to be very fair uh, with members. I indicate, look, you know, let's talk. Now, sometimes I didn't expect everyone to take me up on it. So mm -hmm. when out of uh, 80 assembly members, 75 said, okay, right. let's talk about my bills. I, I thought, okay, let's do that. And then out of 80 senators, uh, I'm sorry, out of uh, 40 senators, 33. Uh, but, but the key for me is transparency, try to be as clear as I can be um, uh, on what we can do. Right. I think we've found ourselves with a little bit more resources in the last few years than, and up until this year. But going forward, uh, so we were able to do more. Mm -hmm. We were able to spend a little bit more money. We were able to look at care courts as an example to address the issue of homelessness and other right. things and give counties a little bit more tools to operate. Um, but there's still a lot of work to be done in that. But that was expensive. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of bills that we move for expensive. Yeah. So going forward, as we can see sort of those recession clouds building on the horizon, mm -hmm. we're going to, and we see our, we're not getting revenues exceeding what the projections were. We're we're seeing revenues coming in well below what the expectation uh, the projections were, and so and at and at levels that we hadn't seen in a long time. So there's uh, quantifiable and qualified data that says things are going to get a little tougher as we go forward on the fiscal side, yeah. which means that I hope it doesn't get to the place where we're making cuts. Although we have reserves and rainy day funds that are very sturdy that we're anticipating changing in the marketplace so mm -hmm. we would be prepared uh, but at the same time this is going to be back to a place where we at least have to pay more attention to the kinds of bills we move forward it may be part of a conversation between leadership in both houses and the governor in terms of how many bills that we maybe even look to put forward this year um, but I do believe it's going to require our collective, you know, in terms of members, um, not necessarily like it was during the pandemic where we had to limit the number of bills in such right. a way that there was sort of this pent up need to, to address so many things. But, uh, and we saw that unleashed this yeah. year. Uh, but I do believe that we're going to have to be a little bit more mindful of the fiscal challenges uh, in front of us going forward. 
um, you know, like a, a year ago, we started hearing the whispers that Lorena was going to resign and, and get a, a you know, a, a job. She's going to uh, leave. Mm-hmm. When did you start thinking like, you know, I'd like to be appropriations chair? Was it in your mind at all? Or did Anthony come up and say, you know what, Chris, I think you'd be a great appropriation chair. <laughs> well, look, I, I was uh, I, was, I was enjoying my job as chair of utility and mm-hmm. energy um, with the kind of issues that we've had to deal with the five years I was there. It was one major uh, challenge after another from year to year. Uh, and so I wasn't really thinking about doing anything other than preparing this year for hearings that we needed to have right. and for where we needed to focus. So when the, I mean, and I, I didn't call Anthony and I said, look, I, really want to do this because I was enjoying right. what I was doing. Um, but, you know, I've always put myself in a position that if if called on uh, to do what a speaker needed me to do, and sometimes, you know, I, I found myself in situations where um, I wasn't in leadership. I wasn't chairing a committee. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I just continued to focus on doing my work, uh, representing the community that I represent in the state, uh, and doing my role to be a good member uh, and to... Uh, be a part of passing good legislation. Um, so I guess it, I guess it really comes down to just being a good team player. Right. So to the extent that you know the speaker uh, called and asked if I were would be willing to to step into the role, I indicated that I would be willing to step into it. Um, and that's to say, and that's not to say that I didn't, I wasn't enjoying what I was doing. Um, and and I tried to recognize that this is an important job. Uh, it takes you know, some real sober uh, thinking around some decisions that need right. to be made. And sometimes they're tough. You don't want to, you don't want to hold bills or change bills that members have become very much right. invested in. Um, but I will say I have a dynamite, the, and I would say with the appropriations chair has a, a dynamite staff that is second to none, a smart and very capable in all areas of policy. And, um, you know that that very that helps instruct me a lot right. in terms of my decision. Because you're ultimately set up to be the bad guy, right? Like you're, <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> you're I, there to give people bad news, and I guess you just have a great bedside manner. Like. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, as a as a policy chair, having been a policy uh, chair, um, I know that there's an important role that each policy chair uh, has. It's not a fun one, right. but sometimes there are. The same role that a probes chair sometimes has to play is mm-hmm. the role that each chair of a committee, policy committee, has to play. There are changes or there's a need to hold bills, and sometimes it doesn't seem right or fair when you're a member right. having that happen to you, but if there is a clear argument that can be made, and I try to make sure that there are clear arguments that can be made, not just doing this because, well, it's like a any, meeny, miny, mo. It's a random right. thing, and yours landed it. But it's to try to make sure that we're putting good policy out, that um, that there are resources to support, uh, and that there is policy that does not create other unintended consequences at some point. So uh, we we just do the job, and that's part of what it is. And uh, I try to be fair to everyone yeah. as best I can. No, it was uh, the suspense file is always is always a surprise. Right? Yeah. Uh, maybe less surprise for you. <laughs> yeah, well, we, we I, you know, yeah, I, it, it's um, we do our very best. Mm. No, definitely, definitely. Um, so this is a kind of an interesting year. Uh, you're coming out off of your tenth year, coming into your your final two. You're in that big class of 2012. Uh, where you guys have what, had 30, 30 some members when you guys came in. Mm-hmm. And now it's kind of like a lot of those members has fallen off. Now you have this new class of 22, yeah. a lot of talk of change and excitement. And, and you know, it kind of probably harkens back to when you first came in. Um, kind of what are your thoughts coming into this session? What, what should we all expect come December 5th uh, in your mind? Um, well, I guess, one, we will have a, a lot of new members mm-hmm. who will be joining the, the ranks, uh, not only in this, well, m- mostly obviously in our house, we'll see uh, a lot of new members coming in. And so I think that brings um, a certain degree of vitality and energy right. and expectations of really making big big things happen as well it should. So we Especially wanna... for the appropriations chair. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, and that's why I want to be very honest about where we are. Yeah. I know um, certainly as we think about, uh, you know, how we can best meet the moment. 
um, because there is a these these are members. All of us are out campaigning. They're hearing from constituents. They're saying, you know, go there, represent us. Make sure that you're part of making good positive change happening, addressing the issue of affordable housing and the other related issues. And so, you know, in many respects, it's going to be, um, you know, with our with my class in 2012, it was a very large class, the largest in a generation. And, and so we had to make sure that we were coming in, understanding that a couple of things needed to happen as I see it. One, we had to make sure that we were being, uh, integrating ourselves in a way that we felt that best met our, our strengths so mm-hmm. that we were part making our way in, even if it was starting at the, you know, at the entry level, if you will, uh, but that we were learning the rules of the house. We were learning how to function as a unit, um, but also have our individuality and understanding that we're trying to put together bills that we hope will make a difference. But there is an institution that that existed before we got to Sacramento, and we wanted to make sure that we were plugging in in a way that we were learning how that institution mm-hmm. works, that we were learning how the relationships between the two houses work, how the floor works, how policy works, how it moves through the through the committees, what the appropriations process looks like, how the governor inter, uh, intercedes in some of the decisions and the role that the governor makes, the budget from the policy, how we can make sure that the budget is reflective of the needs of California and how we can also make sure that the region and the communities that we represent are benefiting to the extent that we could make that happen. And so there's all the different uh, ins and outs of how uh, systems work, uh, learning that, becoming comfortable with that, learning protocols, learning, I mean, we there were certain things that we learned when we came in that you could not do on the floor, that you could not wear on the floor. You had to dress a certain <laughs> right. way. You had to make sure that you were uh, referring to members by their the communities of which they represent as opposed to, you know, Mr. Holden or, right. you know, uh, that type of thing. So it is a it is that type of, um, and many coming from local government, so we had to learn a little bit different way of how to engage. And then you have you know, advocates who are coming in, who are uh, paid advocates or who are nonprofit groups who are saying, we need you to support, you know, one way or the other. Right. Uh, we're used to running into constituents in the grocery store, you know, who sit there in a council meeting and look at you while you're making your decision. Mm. So there's a little bit of a, a dynamic shift there. And I think that, so from that standpoint, um, there will be a period of time adjustment. Um, it's important for leadership, the speaker, to uh, to find what the priorities are of the members of the new caucus, or the new caucus, but the new members who are coming in to join the caucus, uh, to see how they could best fit in and what committees mm-hmm. would be most valuable for them and to try to plug everyone in as best uh, as possible. But I will say for me, after now looking back over 10 years, yeah. um, I'm glad we took it slow at the front end. Uh, there's, right. there's a lot, a lot, a lot of, a lot of devil in the details that we needed to become familiar with so we could become efficient and effective leaders. Because when we turned around, I saw John Perez's class leave, then Tony Atkins class leave. All the, all the spotlight was now on my class. Right. And that happened in a very short turnaround. So now we're the ones making the big decisions. There was like always talk like, oh, 12 years, that's going to be a good time. Like you guys are going to really learn this stuff, get it down. And it feels like it's gone by in like a, a blink. I don't know if it has felt that way to you. It, it, is it enough time? Do you feel like you've been able to master that? Or are you just kind of feeling like, man, I'm just kind of coming into my my groove here. It would have been nice to have another, you know, 10 yeah. years or whatever. I, I think, uh, you know, if it were more than 12, mm-hmm. then that's fine. I, can, I think that there's continuity in that. Um, but there is something that seems to feel right about 12. Mm-hmm. Uh, it seems know, like 10 felt a lot right for a lot of your colleagues. Well, yeah, I think that's right. I think that's probably exactly correct. Right. You know, they're, they're sort of, I mean, you have to fight really hard for some bills that, some ideas, concepts that you believe in. Solitary right. confinement, right? Dual enrollment. Three times I had to take that uh, through the process before I could get it approved and signed by a governor. Um, that takes a lot out of you. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of intensity in terms of, the, this process of fighting really hard in one house to get through policy committee 
getting it through appropriations, getting it off the floor, and then doing it all over again in another house. Right. And 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 that and and there's expectations of success that you want to maintain. There's continuity and value in the legislation that you don't want to see compromised. Um, so that pro and then you know you've got the pros and the cons. You've got the the sponsors who love your bill and everyone who loves them. Right. You've got the opposition who hates, who hates you. your bill and <laughs> and it's like really how do yeah. you how does this happen where you can end up with a bill? So it's always very uh, exciting to see a bill that has no opposition. Right. You know that's bipartisan and bicameral, uh, far and few between. But it's not like Washington. But still you have to fight and you use a lot of energy. And I think that and when 10 years rolls around, you feel the weight of, of and, and it's also the weight of the decisions. Mm -hmm. You know, we're just not talking about simple things. They're talking about consequential things, not just to your district, not just to your state, but consequential things that impact across the United States. And in many ways, we're, because we're a, we're a nation state, as the fifth largest economy Almost in the world. Almost fourth. Almost fourth. Yeah. yeah, we're we're edging up on fourth. Watch out, Germany. I know, right? But but that means that the world is watching what right. we do. Um, there's a lot of responsibility, uh, a lot of pressure that comes with making good, sound decisions because you're making them for others to to hopefully emulate. Right. And you want it to be right. You want it to be impactful and sustainable, and that requires great thought, great weight, but a lot of stress. Can't tell you how many times I went back to my little studio apartment after um, dealing with an issue in utility energy that mm -hmm. recognized that you have the potential to see utility industry uh, up, up, uh, upheaval happen because of liability associated with wildfires. And how do you put down a undergird under those utilities that's righteous and right mm -hmm. to do? Because you can't, you know, you only, you never want to say too big to fail, but if you have a PG&E right. go down and stay down, then a Southern California Edison and a San Diego Gas and Electric are not that far behind. Right. And that means that the investor marketplace has been destabilized. Um, that affects over 80% of families and people in the state who would be impacted if that were to happen. From an area and an industry that nobody really pays attention to until the lights go off, uh, as they would say, all heck would break out right. if all those things would happen. So you go back and you're, you're feeling the weight of these decisions, mm -hmm. and not just me alone, but the members of the committee and the legislative body right. collectively because they're looking to us to bring forward good policy that they can vote on that's going to address this crisis issue. Mm -hmm. And I think those type of things do take a lot out of yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. sometimes there's not a, not a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, and then, and again, like you know, and then we shift to issues like uh, homelessness, mm -hmm. you know, and it's uh, pervasive not just here in California, but certainly here in California, it is it's hitting us hard. Yeah, and, uh, I think uh, I think it's out polling. Like two years ago, you know, they thought funding for homelessness was important, and then recently you see polling that you know we've had funding, right? But it just money's not going to solve these problems, right? And it's it's like you know, and there's not one solution for everything. So that's right. Uh, definitely no shortage of things for you guys <laughs> to no, look at next year. No shortage. Yeah, definitely. Well, yeah. but but I, but I I, tr I I have great high uh, expectation in our leadership uh, in both houses and the governor, and I think that there's going to be you know serious uh, focus on really right. getting our arms around some important things. Yeah. You know, just kind of, you know, closing out, you know, I know during the pandemic, you got a little puppy, a little dog, uh, Kobe, <laughs> ap aptly named, uh, yes. uh, little, uh, was it a shepherd doodle? No, no, he's uh, Aussie doodle. Aussie doodle. Sorry, yes. sorry. Uh, yeah. and, uh, you know, th th you know, this year you're looking at running a bill, uh, doing, uh, kind of helping dogs that get lost, right? Kind of, can you talk a little bit about that and kind of yeah, no, how I, you're helping out those pets? Well, well, clearly, yeah. So we had a constituent in Pasadena who had a real, issue that she was dealing with where her pet dog was was lost was recovered by um and and then became quite frankly the ownership of the the agency and so they essentially turned around and you know and ad had let another family come in and adopt mm -hmm. the the pet which was her pet and so she was trying to find 
how do I get my, and when that became clear, how do I get my, my pet right. back? And so this bill was designed a way to sort of make that clearer and who the, the lawful owner is um, and, and microchips and how that right. can be used for that purpose. And so this becomes a really important way to fix hopefully that problem where if, and then we've, to your point, uh, our Kobe, who was kind of young, um, uh, he's now That's going on three, but, uh, and you know, as an Aussie doodle, he's got, this is a dog I needed when I was in my twenties, but right. anyway, we love Kobe. But had he he got out and he he was out there moving around in the in the neighborhood right. and we were concerned about that. Uh, a neighbor said he's down at their house in their backyard and so we were able to get him in there with and you know happy ending. Secure the gardener left the gate open right. is what happened and he got out. So but but for a person who loses a pet that's like part of the family, it's a big deal. Oh yeah, and. Um, it was important to make sure that if something like that happened to someone again, they could retrieve their pet in a much less bureaucratic and cumbersome way and in a, in a more expedited way. Mm -hmm. So that's what this bill essentially did was to create a mechanism for that to happen. And, and again, like a lot of my bills are brought to me by constituents and right. community groups and so I was happy to be able to run that one. No, no, that's great. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, hopefully you and Kobe get out and start walking some precincts together. Uh, <laughs> get the exercise out of them. Right. Right. Well, we got Thanks, a lot Chris. of we've got a lot of trails in my district. <laughs> and so we, we have good time. Yeah. All right. Thanks a lot.